Good afternoon, everyone. It's three o'clock on Wednesday for those of us that all the days seem to string into one long Groundhog's Day in this pandemic world we live in. Uh, my name is LB Hannis. Any, any and all pronouns for me, I want to welcome you to the SUNY Pride panel, uh, Stonewall to SUNY. Um, before we get started, um, I'd like to um, make a note that uh, Terry Miller, Senior Vice Chancellor for Strategic Initiatives and Chief Diversity Officer, was um, intended to moderate the panel today. Um, she had a last minute engagement she had to, to take care of and that she couldn't get out of despite desperately wanting to be here. So I'm, I'm standing in for her today, um, but wanted to uh, thank her for her help in putting this together and, and we miss her in this conversation. Her, her presence in this is, is deeply profound and, and important. Um, so like I said, my name is LB Hennis. Um, I am the chief strategist for a uh, diversity and consulting firm here in the capital region in Latham. Um, I'm a SUNY Schenectady alum, a proud alum of SUNY Schenectady from the music program and um, recently moved back to the area after being in, in Florida for almost 10 years. And I'm, I'm deeply grateful to be part of, of this, this conversation today. And um, the, my colleagues on the panel are, are deeply insightful and I'm, I'm really excited to, to just help move the conversation along. Um, to get us started, I wanna ground us a little bit in thinking about um, some words from the black liberation activist, prison abolitionist, scholar and activist um, and educator, Angela Davis. She reminds us that being radical simply means grasping at the root of things. In this surge in protesting and civil unrest in support of the Black Lives Matter movement, challenges to think about being radical in pride. We're tasked with remembering and honoring that pride was a riot and a demonstration against police brutality led by black trans and other trans women of color. While we've moved from our roots in uh, pride in the LGBTQI movement since 1969 in the Stonewall Stonewall riots. We're here today, uh, and in particular in, in the month less in the month of June, as Pride Month closes, to remember those radical roots in our in our movement, in our work, and in our lives. Um, I recently had the opportunity to attend the Queer Liberation March uh, last Sunday in Manhattan, and it was a culmination of of a, of bringing the movement back to our roots. Uh, to work against state violence and individual violence and oppression that we're, we're feeling and um, remembering that th these movements are all intersectional. So before we jump into our conversation and I get into the logistics of our call today, I'd like for us to take a moment to remember the lives that are, have been lost in all of, in all of the, the movement work uh, in the long struggle against oppression and particularly honor the black and brown LGBTQI plus people who've been leading the cause and have been part of all the movements, whether or not they've been at the forefront and listened to. Um, so just like to start us there and take, take a moment to, to think of them and remember them and honor them. All right, thank you. Uh, so some housekeeping things before we get into our conversation. Um, as we move through the, the conversation, we'll, we're, we're scheduled to have a, 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 a conversation amongst the panelists for about an hour or so, but if a question comes up at any point, there's a Q&A function that everybody should have access to and we'll be following along to the questions that are coming up from uh, the, the comments and the stories that folks are sharing throughout the, the hour. Um, uh, and around close to four o'clock, we will start answering those Q&A uh, as they came in and, and as they are, are relevant to the conversation. If you're experiencing any technical difficulties, please email specialevents at suny.edu for any help or assistance. We have folks on, on call and standby to, to get you reconnected if for some reason you're not, you're having trouble hearing us or, or seeing us or, or getting uh, into the Q&A function. So again, that, that email is special events at suny.edu for any help. All right, enough for me. I'm gonna turn it over to our panelists. Um, so I'll ask the panelists to share who they are, what they do, their pronouns, uh, any relationship that you, and any relationship that you, you have with SUNY and anything that's helpful for us to know to get to know you as a panelist. Um, and first up is Jordan. 
Hi, so my name is Jordan. I am, my pronouns are he and his. I am a rising senior at Sunny Brook University studying applied math and statistics and biochemistry. Um, some of my roles on campus, I am an RA in our social justice and diversity halls. I work in Cesar Chavez Hall alongside um, our sister building, Harriet Simon Hall. I am also upcoming vice chair for the diversity, equity, and inclusion committee for the SUNY Student Assembly. Um, some of my work on campus also includes founding a group for LGBTQ students in STEM to look at the intersections of people um, in STEM and how LGBTQ people are perceived in STEM and advancement of LGBTQ people in STEM. Um, I'm super excited for the panel and I'll pass the torch. Great, I think Phil is next. Good afternoon, my name is Phil Averse. I am the Chief Operating Officer for In Our Own Voices located in Albany, New York. Um, and we work to promote the health and well-being of LGBT communities of color and address some of our social and health disparities that impact us differently than other, other um, groups. I am a proud alum of the University of Albany um, and have started UAlbany in 1999 uh, mastering in English, urban education, and Latin American Caribbean st studies. Then I did my uh, master's work in liberal studies with a concentration in higher, in higher education and administration studies. And after uh, working for residential life as well, uh, Jordan, as an IRA and, a, and an RD, um, I left the university and began working at Inner Own Voices where I've been for 13 years. Thanks, Philip. Marion? Good afternoon. I'm Marion Terenzio, and I'm finishing my fifth year as president of SUNY Cobleskill. Uh, I, am, uh, I go by she or her. I am a white woman of privilege and I understand what that role means uh, as a change agent. Uh, I'm a community psychologist in my discipline and I've done a lot of work in, with community development and uh, bringing communities together from all factors of a society. Thank you, and Lee? Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lee Melvin. I'm the Vice Provost for Enrollment Management with the University at Buffalo. I've been here seven years in the SUNY system, uh, 26 years in this profession in enrollment management. And so I'm pleased to be here with uh, the panelists today and I look forward to our discussion and conversation. Thank you. Thanks, Lee. Last but not least, Gwen. Hi, my name is Gwen Kay. My pronouns are she, her. I am a historian of gender and medicine and science at SUNY Oswego but I'm also the president of the SUNY University Faculty Senate, representing faculty and staff at the 34 state operating campuses. By virtue of that, I am also a member of the SUNY Board of Trustees. All right, great. Thanks panelists for, for giving a brief insight. Um, and I'm sure we'll find out more about their lived experiences and professional experiences as we move through the afternoon. Um, so we want to start today by talking about the, the intersectional issues with historic movements as a whole, as a whole and, and where we are today. And historically, there's always been people left out of movements and leadership positions or in the history books when we look back on it. You know, women's, women's suffrage predominantly focused and was led, you know, and women of color were left out. The civil rights movement of the 20th century um, didn't include uh, LGBTQ people and the modern LGBTQ rights movement uh, has shifted from its roots to uh, to be predominantly white and cisgender LGBTQ people focused. Um, but today's movement seems to be a little bit more sex intersectional. What, what do you, why do you think that is? What's different about today's movement? Um, and what, do you, what are you seeing and hearing from, from people? Hmm. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna say, I think in many aspects, in many respects, I think access to technology, um, access to, and right now we're in the middle of a pandemic, so I think it's an unfortunate but fortunate perfect storm. Um, a lot of individuals now are not in school, not at work. They have more quote unquote free time on their hands and are able to um, pay more attention. Um, so that coupled with the increase in um, access to technology regarding the videos um, that we're seeing um, is putting more of a face to what for some was just um, isolated incidences. Um, recognizing that it's more than an isolated incident, it's more of a pandemic of its own. Um, so we're dealing with the healthcare uh, pandemic with COVID-19, but we're also dealing with a social pandemic at the same time. So it, it is 
um, that more people have access to the information than before and their eyes are being opened in ways they haven't been before. And I just wanna backtrack again, and just to circle back around movements because it was important. Um, when many people who got here earlier, they saw the image of the Black Lives Matter um, on the street, on Lark Street, that's here in Albany, um, in front of the building that, that our organization owns. We're the only black owned organization in, on, um, on Lark Street. And the Black Lives Matter mural or art installation on that street is couched in between two progressive pride flags that has the black and brown stripe as well as the TG and C colors to show inclusion. And that was very, that was done very much with intention by our, my, our chief um, executive officer to make sure that the conversations were intersectional because at the same time, as we've seen progress, we know there's a lot more progress to go. And the original conversations around Black Lives Matter was not fully inclusive. And people know or don't know around the same time as George Floyd, there was a trans man of color, uh, Tony McDade, who was also murdered by police who did not get the same attention um, in the movement because there always are groups in the margins. And I mentioned, and you mentioned earlier, looking at the history, um, who was at the margins of the suffrage movement? Black women. All women didn't get the right to vote. And the civil rights movement, even though some of the, the architects of the civil rights movement were part of the LGBT community, they didn't see the same freedoms. And even with the LGBT community, our trans and gender non-conforming non-binary individuals are oftentimes left out. And the example I usually give is looking at New York State, for example, people see us as the beacon of progress. <laughs> um, and we know that that is not always accurate. And we, we passed in 2002 SONDA, which is the Sexual Orientation Non-Discrimination Act that protected individuals from um, discrimination in housing, school, public accommodations, et cetera. Um, but it didn't protect our transgender, gender non-conforming individuals. It wasn't until almost 20 years later that gender um, the Gender Expression Non-Discrimination Act was signed in. So there's always groups in the margins. So we want, to, we want to make sure that when we're talking about Black Lives Matter, that the groups and individuals who are in the margins are brought to center. So that was kind of um, the purpose of us couching that mural with the progressive flags. To add to uh, what Philip was saying, it's not just technology, it's also the allowing of what we would call the herd mentality. Uh, so, you know, I don't think people realize that while you're on these social media platforms, uh, you're only hearing of like-minded or like-kind. You're not hearing the dissenting voice and or it became very scary in terms of bullying, in terms of that herd mentality. So I don't think it's just technology. I think it's the uh, lack, I hate to use this word, but it's a lack of sophistication of understanding how technology is actually, uh, uh, I would say, manipulating us. And I do think those in power who know that have used those platforms very, very well and have made it so ensconced in us to the point that many of us have become mute and do not know how to bring an alternative voice forward. I would add from a historical perspective that as LB mentioned at the beginning, every movement for reform has omitted major groups and it takes a while and it accumulates and every generation rests on the shoulders of their predecessors and can't appreciate all that their predecessors did for them, which is not an excuse. And every generation says, ah, but younger generation, they don't understand. We were so good. And I mean, for hundreds of years, they say this. So one of the things that I am seeing that is wonderful is that we're not going to get everybody, unfortunately, but we are at a place where there's been more and more and more and more work and it's built and built and built. So there's now possibilities for many more people who have been marginalized. The margins are getting, we hope, smaller and smaller and smaller. And there are few fewer people out on the margins as this inclusive circles get bigger and bigger and bigger and we can pay attention to those groups that weren't part of the original calls for civil rights and suffrage and all those historical kinds of reform movements that are critical for our society's well-being. I really like that point on how generational activism looks different. Um, we talked a little bit in our meeting yesterday um, about the paradigm shifts that occurred with um, the Stonewall riots and before the Stonewall riots, we saw groups like the Mattachine Society, which were largely white men in business attire that would protest, arguing on the basis that 
LGB people are the same functionally as straight people, therefore they deserve the same rights. Um, we look at this now and we think that that viewpoint is very regressive or it's not progressive in its nature, but it's in the context of a time period that just the accusation of being gay could get you institutionalized for the rest of your life. Um, and then we look at when the Stonewall riots occurred, it was the hyper-marginalized queer youth and trans youth, um, and especially the trans people of color of Stonewall that put everything on the line to riot and protest. And then subsequently, we returned back to um, groups, white groups in power taking pride back. Um, and I think we see a lot of cycles in representation. Most recently, we've seen that shift to corporate pride, where we tokenize a lot of identities instead of actually representing those identities and letting those identities be seen, heard, and represented. Um, so I think that this is the next shift with all the advances we have in technology um, and the, the, the interactions with the pandemic and um, all these coming together to actually show good representation um, in contrast to what we've seen with corporate pride. So I wonder if we would be having this intersectionality if it wasn't Pride Month. And because, you know, you know, for this to occur um, during this month, you know, and then some people will have a lot of concerns about uh, groups co-opting uh, what they think it should be their movement. While, yes, you want to uh, have uh, equality, you know, for all, uh, and you don't want to leave anyone out, um, I, I, just, I just wonder if we would still have, you know, this conversation, you know, about the pride side. Um, because many of us, you know, um, when we think about our lives and depending on where you are in the age groups, um, you, you would say, you know, how I describe myself is as a black gay man. And so not as a gay black man. And so, and, and so it, it's just, you know, as we think about where we are this month, I, I think it is you know, fortuitous that we can um, bring all these groups together, and as Gwen said, bringing people in from the margins, you know, and as Philip said, using the technology to bring this together, and then of course, you know, as Marion has said here, regarding, you know, making people more informed about all the lives that are out there, but especially black and brown lives. So I don't want to lose, and I, know, I don't think our folks will, but lose the importance of the black and brown life experience here. Uh, along with this opportunity, uh, and to me it is, uh, uh, with being in Gay Pride Month, which I think is a great month to celebrate. Um, and so, but I, I just wanna make sure that as we think about all of this, that there's some other um, initiatives at play and we need to make sure that everyone stays on the same footing and that whatever we are expecting to come out of this movement, that it still honors the black and brown lives that we uh, have to make sure it stays at the forefront. Can I add to that? Because you're right. It, with the women's movement, everybody said, and, 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 and sometimes you lose your focus. And that's the problem. The other thing about bringing people in from the margins, it's not just bringing them in. You've got to make sure a social structure or order exists. Here's a very simple example. If a parent loses a child, what social structure name do we have for them? Because if a children loses a parent, they're an orphan, right? If a spouse loses a spouse, they're a widow or a widower. There is no such social structure name for the other experience because no one wants to deal with it. So if there's no, and this is simplistic, I get that, right? But if there's no social order name, there's no social order structure or identity for folks to find themselves. Uh, so it's not enough just to bring them in. And I think that's part of the issue is that uh, the mar th those who were in the margins now are like, okay, fine, but where do I go from here? What has to change now? And I agree with them. I think what, one of the things that we talk about is one way in which to, to attempt to do that is centering their voices. So not enough to say, come along on a journey with us, but also you are the leaders and the masters of your own experiences and the experts of your own experiences. So we wanna hold you up um, let people become aware because like you said, um, people are not having access to information or, or understanding of the struggles of different groups. So I think not just saying, okay, we're going to pull you in and you're going to march with us or you're going to be a token or a figurehead, but we're going to center your voices. We're going to lead with you all um, because you're the 
unknown territory, you know, the, the last chartered, you know, front frontier. So yeah, so I think that is a very important point that you made, Marion, is how to you not know, just bring them in, but you also have to center and lift them up um, and provide them with the supports. Yeah, and I, I really like that um, in the lens of a lot of organizations, I serve on diversity, equity, and inclusion. You know, we've looked at diversity and getting a diverse set of students or whatever in your organization is very important. But without equity and inclusion, you're going to fail the students that you've tried to incorporate. Diversity is the representation, equity is the resources that are needed to succeed, um, and then inclusion is making sure that all students and all individuals that have been welcomed in feel welcomed and are truly welcomed, not just taken in. Um, and I really like that shift that we're looking at um, more of the broader resources that are needed to make sure that um, our, our minority students and our, in, in all of our levels of organization um, have the resources they need for succeed, to succeed. Part of the resources is knowing who the allies are, and it means that allies need to be strongly, staunchly visible and repeatedly because students change and staff change and faculty change, and you can't look at a person, yes, I present as a white female, but you don't know what my lived experience is and what my family constellation looks like. So you might not know why, it doesn't matter, but I have many, groups to which I am allied for deeply personal reasons and others for which I am allied for deeply social justice held reasons. But I need to be visible and inclusive as I'm thinking about diversity on these campuses and in all the spaces that we are. And so that goes to not just this month, as Lee said, but making sure that conversation's happening all the time over and over and over again. Yeah. Yeah, I, the the things that are coming up for me in terms of the um, there's two things that are resonating, kind of a collection of, of what y'all are, are talking about is there seems to be I was at um, while I was on the city for the march, I also stopped by the Occupy City Hall movement that's, um, um, you know, sitting out um, demanding that the, the city um, government defund the, the police and it, it, it is a deeply diverse and skews young but very diverse cross-section of people and and while there's certainly is a, a center laser focus on black lives matter there are there was an immigrant rights organization that came through and was on the agenda they're talking about uh, the, the interconnectedness of the issues and so i think there's um because we've learned from the the challenges of prior movements and the ways that people have, have had to fought to be heard within movement and, and activism um, we've learned from from generations and i think there's a there's a there's an understanding and a consciousness of how interconnected the issues are that i feel like even when i was i'm 35 even when i was uh you know 20 years old 20 year olds will now have this you know a, a level of consciousness about if if we aren't connected on these issues, they're going to exploit us to work against the work against the other pe the other the other um, groups of people, and so you're stronger together. And we're getting it seems like we're getting uh, not perfect because there is no perfection, and we're learning as we're going. Some kind of nimbleness and flexibility around how to not steal the spotlight, but but provide context to how all the issues are are interconnected. I also wonder because of the pandemic and you know the United States is also highly individualistic if we're kind of I just see a rejection uh, of individualism to, towards more collectivism and and we're in this kind of together mentality and maybe that's lending itself to um, you know a, a movement that's trying to be more intersectional and trying to do better and trying to trying to to um, you know support people in the in the issue specific um, and not and not have folks get lost like they they have before anybody anything else to add on on this particular issue Gwen is sort of thinking about this moment and the protest that you were participating in LB which is that I think people are becoming more visibly public about their support of various movements in part because people might feel hesitant about being in a march right now because of the pandemic. And so if they can't physically go, maybe they can drive by and honk in support, or they can put signs on their car, or they can hang a flag. And I think that people who previously might have 
shown up in one way are now showing up in much more visible ways because they are fearful, concerned about their health, the health of people in their household. And so they can't put their body on the line in one way, but they can in a different way. And I want to not to be the, the, the downer in the group because <laughs> we want to keep it real. We want to be real and honest. And we've seen a lot of progress and we've seen a lot of movement. We've seen a lot of collective uh, mobilizing, but they say for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. There's also been a huge uptick in individuals who have been very vocal against these movements, saying we're, we're shifting towards a, a two PC society that everybody wants to be politically correct and nice, and it's not, and it's doing a disservice to the community, and it's it's compromising and um, stepping on other people's rights and and all of that. So that's that's the unintended consequence and backlash that's happening now. And I think I want to just put that to the forefront to make sure that that is also being recognized and being a part of the conversation. How do you address and, ch and or challenge um, some of those um, individuals and groups that are, are resistant to shifts and change and the um, direction that so many of us are going in? Yeah, Phil, Philip, I, I appreciate that. I think it's, it's so true. In, in Dr. Ibram Kendi's book, he talks about racial progress. There's a trajectory of racial progress, but along with it is racist progress. It just keeps up with it at the same time. It's not, it's not like it's, there's that myth of that, the trajectory of, of justice you know, arcs, but the, the trajectory of injustice is, is trying to keep pace and is ahead of it, is always ahead. And so right. I think for real, I, I appreciate you reminding us that. And um, we're always working against that. Um, so I, I, I want to continue with this thread of like generational activism. And, and I know during our, our prep call, we talked about how um, history and life experiences can change perspective. And um, in the SUNY system, faculty are typically much older than the student population, which sometimes creates a gap of understanding. Um, can we talk a little bit about that and how that impacts um, the, you know, the experience and, and maybe how your own history and life experiences inform um, the work that you do and, and your perspective on, on the issues? I might be the youngest of the faculty people, <laughs> um, or not. One thing about being on campus is that, on the one hand, I am definitely older than my students. On the other hand, being on a campus keeps one exposed to so many ideas that it keeps one much more plugged in than one might be otherwise. And so what I've seen and I see this with friends across the country and other people in other places. I have a different understanding of some issues because I hear my students talking about them. I talk with them. I go to events on campus and I engage because it's so immediate and so accessible. And if I don't understand something and want to know more about it, I have faculty, students, staff. I have lots of people I can ask questions to. And I've never had anyone be dismissive. If I'm asking a question, I'm curious that people are happy to talk. Even if I disagree with what they're saying, I'm asking because I want to understand. So there is absolutely a generational gap, but I think that it comes with, and this is for staff as well as faculty, we've chosen to be on a campus. We've chosen to be around people who are exciting and interesting and engaged and to take advantage of that opportunity to keep on stretching our minds and learn more and take advantage of the proximity we have to all of this excitement that's happening. I would agree with that, but as a president too, um, there are other things that I've been noticing and have to really pay attention to. First of all, uh, I have students who advise me. To Gwen's point, uh, I have an advisory group and I listen because they are, we have to give them credit that they are leaders, but I think it may not be so much of a generational gap, but that faculty, if you think about it, a lot of us grew up in the system where we didn't know anything. As a matter of fact, when I was in college, I was called a, a barbarian, as just because I was a student, and we took that. So I know the faculty member might have meant it lovingly, but they didn't think of us as partners in their education. And I think because education's changing, the faculty are seen more as facilitators of the student learning and to allow that space for students to be a part of it, because usually we're like, 
no, no, you don't know what you're saying. No, 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 no. We will tell you what you need to learn. I think that, that the other piece of it is, as I, education has broadened those students who now deserve and have the access to it, we have old systems of even grading. There's a book called Grading for Equity. It's quite an interesting book. Uh, but we have all these old systems that have been placed for years and years that do not allow for the kind of student learning that's coming forward now or the way students are learning. So the other thing to add to that is I call it that when the academy, when I was in the academy, and Gwen, yeah, I think I'm older than you, um, we were really producing what I call mini-me's, right? The academy was more about getting the, the PhDs out there and the other kinds to propagate your field. That's not the case anymore, perhaps why students are coming uh, to college. So there's such a uh, tension between what faculty are expecting from their learners and what students are expecting. And I think that's also part of this complete uh, misalignment. I think there's definitely room for growth. Um from my experiences in uh, the organization that I founded for LGBTQ students in STEM, um, it's called OSTEM. We've looked at retention rates across various STEM fields and it shows that in STEM fields that are considered more core, like physics, biology, chemistry, and math, where identity seems less important in your work, um, LGBTQ students are less included, feel more um, marginalized in their work and feel less respected for the work they're doing. So I think there's a lot of room for growth in and changing the dynamic for researchers and, and educators and how we interact with students and see that even in sciences where you might think that personal identity doesn't matter, our biases as well as our unique perspectives are valuable in, in research fields. So I think that there's a lot of room for growth um, in working with educators and being inclusive for our students. So I'll add on the generational gap piece here, um, because, uh, you know, Marianne, maybe we're close to the same age, you know, we'll see. But, <laughs> but as we think about uh, um, how students transition to a college, especially a college campus and looking for higher education, um, I've always thought of college and, and, and the college campus as this island. And we all get to go to this magical island and we get to live out these lives that we didn't have at our home. We get to remake ourselves into something else. So as you talk about the mini me's, um, we do aspire to, uh, you know, um, replicate uh, how our, our supervisors, our teachers um, present themselves to us. And so then when we leave the campus, then we're off the island. And so now we have to deal with our communities and, and things aren't as magical in the, you know, once you're off the island. And so uh, the thing that I really appreciate about it is that, uh, and you're right, uh, that we do get to continue to grow. And I think that's important. All of us are growing and learning. Uh, it's just when we, many of us are coming through this system, uh, there weren't a lot of folks out uh, that we knew who were gay or lesbian or bisexual, transgender, um, trans, transgender, anything that that's just wasn't there. Um, and so it, it wasn't visible to us, except for those of us who were out in college. And then people knew though, that that's that one or two uh, person, persons that, you know, that, that identify that way. And so, so it is uh, different because we grew up at a time where you were supposed to not discuss certain issues and topics. And depending on the type of institution you attended, and I attended a small Christian school in Texas. And so as a, a out person, you know, and, and back in that time. So it was quite interesting to have conversations there. But there were just discussions people didn't talk about. When you met with faculty members or advisors, you, did, you couldn't find anyone like you. But now that's available to our young students. Uh, we were really pleased with, I am at least, what, what I, the freedom I see people express about themselves and uh, what they want to be and there doesn't seem to the barriers and the walls don't seem to be as high as they were before especially as you went through your employment and your career and trying to advance and someone that on my level as a vice provost and an administrator um, we and, and especially in enrollment we go out and tell students this is what we have waiting for you on our campuses so we make a promise to you and we want to deliver on that promise. And then we have an understanding of what students want. But it is uh, different now because we have students that come to us and say, I really want to learn about 
you know, your, 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 the, uh, the gay people on your campus, you know, do you have a space for us? And the same thing that we've heard you know, before that, with, especially with our, our black and brown students, do you have a space for us? Our female students, do you have a space uh, for us on the campus? And so, um, so and, and that's what we really have to think about now is like, do we have a space for them? And then connecting to our communities, will there be a space for them once they leave our campuses? So, so that's when I think about the generational pieces is that we have so much here and are we preparing you for the reality uh, of the world? And we think we are, but then you have to go out into the real world and then make spaces for others that are coming behind you. So that's why when I think about the generational piece, we, we did our activism quite differently. We presented ourselves differently back in the 80s and the 90s and how you work with folks and even in the early 2000s, <laughs> 70s, okay, American, 70s. Uh, but, uh, but, it's, but still we have a, a, a similar goal, right? And a similar interest in people being treated equal, um, people being treated with dignity and with respect uh, people uh, ask, asking that if they go for a loan at a bank, things won't be held against them. Or if they go for promotions on jobs or into our military, that they have a right to be a, a good citizen in this country, uh, regardless of that they're the LGBTQ community. And just, you know, there's a lot of letters there that weren't there when I first started in this business. And But I, I've been trying to keep up so we make sure that uh, we can identify all those, those that are connected you know, to our environment. Philip, I wonder about your your lived experience, having you know been on a, a SUNY campus, and then as Lee talks about leaving the island and, and doing work in the community. What's your what's your experience of the differences of the activism, or or even your own lived experiences about different from being on campus to to being a community member and doing community based work? Well, I feel like I hit the jackpot working for the organization that I work for. I work for an LGBT people of color organization. So I can definitely show up my whole self authentically with no, none of the problems or barriers that a lot of my um, siblings and, and, and identity has to go through. So that is a, a blessing that I'm happy for every single day I wake up. Um, as far as lived experience, I think that's something that is, it, it, there's no marker of finish <laughs> because you're living until you're no longer living. And every day is a new experience. And I think for me as, um, and I was, I was speaking to some group, some individuals about this yesterday, but finding out what it means to have intersecting identity that you can't silo. You can't silo, today I'm gonna just be a black man, tomorrow I'm gonna be gay. Like, you can't do that, you exist in your whole being at all times. So for me, finding out what does it mean and fighting against social stereotypes and beliefs about how I am supposed to be as a black man, and then also doing the same with um, with um, being part of the LGBT community. And Lee mentioned earlier before as the um, campuses and school being an island, um, for some communities, being going to campuses or going to school is you're a sellout. <laughs> you're trying to be white. You're trying to, you know, academia is was something that is for many people in the community was like, what are you doing? This is not for us. And I and I spoke about in a, in a previous panel um, the guilt and shame that was associated with that for me at a certain period of time as a black man because um, I'm a big guy and I've, I've been big for most of my life and people automatically assume I would go into football or sports and I'm a I'm a mental person so I was on the debate team all every all four years of, of high school I was a captain for two of the four years and I used to wrap, wrap my um, trophies uh, that I used to win in a towel or my shirt or my jacket on the way home from school because I was either getting sick of people asking, oh, is that for football? Is that for football? And I have to explain debate. And then you, it was a debate and you have to hear the, well, you think you white or why? What is this? What's, you know, so it wasn't until my father, you know, got me together and was like, yo, because he saw me walking home one day and was like, what are you doing? Why are you hiding your accomplishments? Be proud of who you are. Be unapologetic. And that's from that moment on, from that moment on I was like, okay, I'm not going to be ashamed or try to live up to anybody else's um, beliefs of what a black person is a, black, um, a person of color is supposed to be like. And it was the same with the LGBT community looking at, do I behave this way? Do I hang with these social circles? Do I go to this, this um, venue? Do I go take these courses? Do I, you know, what does it mean to be authentically and truly a part of the community? Um, so the lived experiences was a, was a struggle for a lot of time. <laughs> and it was, when I did go to UAlbany, we had a Pride Alliance and someone actually came into our Pride Alliance one day and said, hey, Pride Alliance is all great and all, but 
can I see all the people of color in the hallway? And they put us in the hallway. It was like, we have a, another group that we're starting for to address our issues. And this was in like 2000, because I started you Albany in 99. So it was like around 2000, 2001. And they were like, and I was kind of like, this is awkward. <laughs> what is it? Like, are we one community? Are we? I'm a baby gay. I don't know there's the differences of, you know, what we're supposed to do. And I actually went to the to the group and, you know, went to a couple of the groups. It was off campus and it was a wonderful experience. And I went to both. I went to um, the Pride Alliance on campus and I went to the separate group. And 10 plus years later, turns out, or close to 10 years later, that's the organization I was working for. <laughs> now, in our voices, I didn't know it at the time, but it was one of the first programs that they started um, when they were founded in 1998. And I was actually a part of the, the group. So it is important to, to recognize the intersecting identities have their own unique issues and they have crossover issues as well. And it can be challenging. So I'd like to add on to two things that Philip said, and thank you uh, for that um, information uh, about you and, and, and your world and, and what you're doing. I think that's great. I think you do have a great job. That sounds exciting. <laughs> um, and so one, when you mentioned about have to bring my whole self, uh, you know, you know, to the, the place where I am. And that's something you know that I've worked on uh, my life. Where I tell when I'm interviewing for jobs, I tell people I have to bring all of me. You have to hire all of me, not just part of me. And so, and I'm going to take it back even further with um, when I think about um, I went as many I, I shared earlier. I was at a religious school in Texas, and so it was, uh, religion was a big part of my life. But after that experience, uh, became a very small part of my life. And, and not that they did anything wrong. It's just how you're treated, what's said, and what you have to put yourself through. And so and many years later, a um, you know, grown man, married, and, and you know, having a, a good life and a great husband. And, and my mother's all very, very proud of me. And so the, after my wedding, my mother pulled me aside and said, I really want you to get back into the church. And I said, well, mom, you know, our church, I, I want to go where I, all of me can be accepted. And, and you know, my mother, she's always been a very smart person. She says, well, I saw on TV, there are churches that will accept all of you, you know? And so uh, she says, I think you can get back to it. And so you go find, you know, that church that you need. And then the last piece is that, you know, when you talked about like being a, a black gay man or a gay black man, um, and I saw one of the questions in the uh, area that I'm gonna address this quickly, is that when all of us walk through the door, there is something that people see. You walk through a door where they're not expecting you. You don't know all the people across the room either, but when you walk in, they start to identify you. And I just want, so the people that ask the question, like what's the difference between the gay black man and the black gay man? When I walk in that room, you tell me what you see. When I have this debate with, you know, um, my, my white gay friends, I tell them, I say, I don't have gay tattooed on my forehead. I know you can get it done if you want, but I just don't have it. Um, but, but I tell them, I said, when I walk in, they see a male, they see a black male, usually they see a black male first and then all the other things and until I express some things to them. Same thing with our uh, 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 female friends here or if, if you're, if you know, uh, in between, you know, people, they don't know what they see till you start talking. But when they see people of color, they see that color and they make those assumptions. And, and just as you said, Philip, people assume that your awards are because you played football. Um, and so, and people assume that I went to college because I played football and I've met people who assume that they say, oh, you're not, when I wasn't married, they say, oh, you're not married. And the next question was, do you have children? And I would say, well, didn't I just tell you I wasn't married? You know, what kind of person do you think I am? <laughs> you know, so, uh, but so there's all these assumptions that come along with us as human beings that come along with us because of our race, that come along with us because of our sexual orientation. Once we express that. And so it, it's, it is important that you always be your whole self, that you bring yourself to that meeting, to that interview, that you, you know, do uh, say that I can pursue things that we couldn't pursue before. When we talk about that generational gap, there were things, and we, we could go to church, but we couldn't say who we were because we were getting beat up in church uh, from the sermon and from the pool. Uh, so that made it very difficult on many of us. And so, but and we can go to job interviews and it's very difficult for people, once you get the job, then you had to talk about your partner. Now you can talk about your spouse and but at least some people are very polite about it. Is it a male or a female? You know, so, or, so that, that's always nice these days, but a lot has changed. And, and for many of us, we're glad it's a little more progressive, but we also still see, um, you, know, you know, where that, that um, stone ceiling is still up there for some of us as we go through it, but bringing all of yourself Philip, I'm glad you talked about that. And also your accomplishments and who you are and correcting people when they make stereotypical uh, 
conversations or examples of you? Yeah, the, the theme that, that kind of resonates, um, one of the themes that was resonating with all of y'all sharing was the role of, of, of mentors or, or other people in your life throughout your, your journey, whether you're in a mentor role or, or, or have had the opportunity to have good mentors or people that were guiding you that led you down a path that wasn't right for you. And I think, you know, uh, I had a career in academia for almost 10 years before I, I stepped out into the private sector. And as a as a, a young queer and trans person that grew up, um, I'm a, I'm an older millennial, so I grew up without the internet and without having connection to a community uh, on the internet and in a small conservative town. And um, I, when I got to academia, I initially floundered, but then I found myself at SUNY Schenectady and um, thought I wanted to be a music teacher. Then I went out to teach and you know, that was an unsafe place for me in the K through 12 context. And I went back into higher ed and became a higher education professional. And I clung to academia because I wasn't ready to be out in the real world. And that was the safest place that I could be as a white queer and trans person. Um, and so I think some of us have uh, opportunities to um, find homes in academia, but I also think that I probably stayed in a little too long because I was scared about, about stepping out that I, that I wasn't going to have the, the, the connection or the built in community that y'all are talking about. I was scared to get off the Island. Um, and I, and I wonder for those of us that are still in higher ed and mentor people or not even in higher ed, just mentoring people. Um, how are we, how are we setting up support systems when folks, um, if, if they don't have it, when they're uh, when they come off the island or if they don't have access to the island at all as there's so much privilege that comes with access of, 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 of education and then i'm going to transition us to probably our final question before we jump into the q a um you know lee and philip were talking about being you know being read as black men wherever you go and your race your, your race is you know not something that you can hide and um maybe sexuality is something that you can you know weave around and, and, and don't have to be super explicit about it at the beginning. And for gender, conf gender non-conforming people, it, it might not be the same. Um, and so I wonder, you know, and this is a challenge for, for the white folks on this panel and, and, and certainly the cisgender folks on the panel around um, allyship and how do we bring ourselves, what does your allyship and activism look like and, and particularly about allyship um, when it comes to um, bringing your full self? How are we challenging white folks to bring their, if you identify as an anti-racist white person, we have to bring ourselves uh, as anti-racist white people to our work too, that is part of our, our full self. And, and what does your allyship look like? What does your activism look like? How has it changed? Um, and what are you hoping to be? So for me, allyship has taken um, a couple different forms. Um, as an RA, I've been able to engage on my campus in education, um, educational diversity programs and programs that teach, like they, they package social justice and the initiatives and education in a very palatable way to our students. Um, and I've also been able to be in a position where I can um, voice when I see issues of discrimination and be able to stand up and say like, that's not okay. Um, over the summer, allyship has taken a different turn for me. Personally, I do have health conditions that have prevented me from going to um, active protests. I have participated in driving protests and I have found a lot in myself through um, art and I have now used art to start fundraising and activism. In our prep call I was wearing um, a Black Lives Matter shirt that said say their names. I've been creating stencil artwork and spray paint to make clothing and I'm going to start fundraising. So that's my form of acti activism with my um, like over this this summer and in this time. That's how I've taken on allyship and activism. Uh, in my role as president, it's a, it, there is a pretty big pulpit that I can use. And my allyship comes in so many forms. When I first came to the college, I was told I couldn't do certain things because I had to protect the college. I couldn't be my full self, Lee or Philip, because I had to protect the college. And at first that was very resentful. And then I learned to find my way with that because I realize I am SUNY Cobaskill. If the college speaks, it's through my voice. 
So my ally is the institution and I am the institution's ally. What I do with that matters, critically matters. So a couple of things I've done as an individual to start with when I first came. I grew up in that generation where if you were gay, you didn't say a word. I was a terrific softball player. And as a matter of fact, I used to throw the softball so hard that you couldn't catch it. And somebody said to me, if you keep that up, you're not going to get a man. Well, thank God it didn't matter. Um, but, you know, how could you share that back then, right? <laughs> but You just threw it harder, right, Marion? You just yeah. threw it, yeah, you know, to throw I, it harder. <laughs> you're right. That's exactly what I did, LB. So what I had, what the gift I gave my students, which was a big deal for me, because I was a very private person, you know, and that whole thing that, you know, your private person is political was very difficult. So when I got on campus, I shared my stories with my um, LGBTQ plus students and told them how I was bullied too. Uh, and, you know, I was very open as, I'm a very strong leader, no doubt. If you see me, I'm very tall. I present myself in a very strong way. And to say to my students that I was bullied or to say to them I was scared was my way of being an ally to say, it's a-okay. I'm extremely approachable. I am a human being. And these are the pieces I bring with me. I then became uh, one of the uh, panelists and the co-sponsor presidents for the Spectrum Conference. So I'm standing up with my gravitas to give to that important conference, which is actually going to still happen this year. The hard part, like I said, was in terms of I could not put in my political persuasion. And that still bothers me to this day. And I have to do that right now. And I can't even tell you where I would stand. You probably could guess. Because Colbuskill has a major role to play in my students' lives. And anything I do personally that would affect or put them in danger, I can't. So it's a hard understanding to be an ally and what I am sacrificing to be my whole self. So the other thing that I find uh, very important with, is my messaging. So I was one of the campuses that had a heck of a time uh, with students who are putting up really bad stuff. If you go to my website now, it's called the Do Better Campaign, and, and Gwen's well aware of what I'm up to with that, and putting now action to voice. But one of my students, two, two things I want to share with you, because it's so powerful, and I want my students to be allies with me. Right? Because when I first came to Cobleskill, there was a group called LAC, Locals Against College Kids. They don't exist anymore, by the way, which I'm very proud of. But um, when I talked to one of my students who felt very scared and alone, I said, you know, education is the hope of the world. And she looked right at me because I talked to them virtually. I didn't want to be on the phone with them. She said, President Terenzio, it depends how you're educated. It depends who's educating you. It depends if you're learning hate. And she stopped me cold to say, just don't stand up there and say, higher ed, education is it. We're the bastion. To your point, Philip, there's a lot of backlash that's also happening on college campuses. So the other thing a student asked me, and I'm going to do this, is will you stand up and apologize for the history of racism that's happened on the campus? And I said, Yes. Now that's going to be an ally. How I figure that out, it may not be me as an individual. It may be the college as the ally I give back to my students because my college may not be my student's ally. You understand? What I'm, it's, it's a very interesting, powerful position to be in. I'm humbled every day by that. And all the stuff I went through, they're all going through as a leader. I feel privileged to be a leader at this time, even though it is the toughest act on the planet right now. Because I can see how my allyship as a president, as the institution, can make a big difference in my students' lives. My role has actually shifted. When I was on campus, I was extremely, increasingly more and more and more visible and public and putting up signs and things on my door and things on my syllabus and putting things that out that weren't coded but if you knew what you were looking for you knew what you could see and i would be very supportive and talk explicitly about things 
In my current role, I am much more conscious of my allyship and that I need to be much more visible. And as a member of the board of trustees, need to be much more visible and push myself and push others and explicitly um, as every campus was putting out statements in support of Black Lives Matter and responding to George Floyd's murder, the Faculty Senate Executive Committee put out a statement as well because we needed to. It was the right thing to do and we all were doing individual things, but as a body, we needed to make a very public statement. And it ruffled some feathers and it made some people unhappy, but that's good because that's what an ally should do is just be out there as a visible, I am ruffling your feathers, keep on being ruffled, that's okay. But it's, it's been a, a challenge and there have been moments where it's been important to just be present. So a few years ago, Courtney Dallard came and is on the, as one of the participants today, I think, and gave this amazing presentation to the Board of Trustees and the Student Life Committee. And it was, you could see people nodding and understanding and they finally got some of what Courtney was talking about. And it, in and of itself, it was wonderful, but to see the ripple effect it had on the everybody else in the room was phenomenal. And to keep on being able to go back to that conversation with people in their difficult moments, don't you remember when we heard, don't you remember, we could do more because, that has been really, really helpful. So taking those moments and expanding them and pushing them forward and helping make other people uncomfortable can sometimes be a very comfortable thing to do. Can I, can I add something as well? Um, and thank you all for your, your, your words on allyship. And I think one of the things is for me is important is for people to recognize this is a time of, of learning. And LB, you mentioned anti-racist. I think that's a relatively new term, and I think people are, aren't really fully aware of what that means. And so they're just thinking, um, I'm not racist. <laughs> and being not racist is not being anti-racist. And anti-racist denotes having to also do the work to combat racism, because there are many people who are, quote unquote, self-proclaimed allies to us who are reinforcing racism and racist systems. And they may, may or may not be aware of it. So this is a time for really education and learning and recognizing what it is to truly be anti something, anti homophobic, anti racist versus just not being racist because your personal beliefs and the things, your internal thoughts don't always create change. You have to put work and action behind those thoughts and that looks different for different folks. So we have to, as LGBT people, as people of color, we always have to assess our safety. And what does that look like to be vocal, to be verbal, to challenge systems, to challenge individuals, because it's not always safe for us to do so. Um, and you have to find creative ways. And I know Gwen mentioned earlier, you know, writing letters instead of if you can't go into a protest because we're in the middle of a pandemic, you know, maybe drive by and, you know, honk the horn and support or challenge a family member at a, at a family dinner or, or share a social media post or, or a story that you've done your research on, and you know, it's accurate. <laughs> you know, it's not blindly sharing something because it fits your own internal narrative. Um, so it's, there's a lot of work that you can do to be anti-racist, anti-homophobic, anti anything but it, that anti is the act action word is not just oh i believe this because you still could be reinforcing racist systems and institutions so i just wanted to bring that up when we're talking about allyship because many people believe they're allies and they're actually creating um harm and um more challenges for communities that they proclaim that be an ally for so you know i'm going to share some things with you regarding allyship um, so there are two people I live for in this world right now. Uh, one is my mother, who has who has loved me unconditionally, and then one is my husband. And sometimes they go back and forth. Who's number one? Just depends on who's being nicer to me uh, that month. Um, but I just want you to know I, th that's who I live for. And many of you have things that you live for that you believe in. Um, I know that my mother is you know proud of me. Uh, what really moved me a couple of weeks ago is when. You know, at my mother's age, who's 82, she has to call her son and ask him if, you know, are you being safe? And I haven't had that in a very long time. And, and, I, and, and that's, it really touched me. And I told her, yes, we are being safe. You know, she, you know, and she's asking me the question she asked when I was a young 
man? You know, um, are you minding your manners? Are you making sure you're not looking threatening? Are you, you know, and, and, and I try to let her know the world has changed a little bit more than that, but it, it did bother me. And, I, and my mother knew I, when I was young, I was an activist and I did a lot of things. Then we, we did marches because we wanted to see in your parking lot in high school, you know, those type of things. And, uh, but different uh, activism that was going on. But I think about the people that I live for and the people that are around me. And I live for the, the, the younger generation because you have to find your allies and, and you have to have your allies speak up. Um, and so as several of the panelists have said here, it's like finding like your voice uh, to make that happen and when it happens. And a very short story for you, I was at a national convention and there was a presenter up on, on the panel and I swear it was a joke the way he was talking the way he disparaged women, uh, minorities, uh, black women, looking for uh, this group of black women in the audience going, where are my mothers, where are my mothers? And they were just as perplexed as the rest of the audience. We really thought this was some joke, some act that this guy was putting on to teach us something. But he continued through the rest of his presentation just really insulting the whole group. And so when it came to the Q&A, um, my first colleague got up and asked a question as if nothing had occurred. And, and this was a white colleague of mine. And I was like, okay. And I said, so I put my name in for the next question. And I thanked the entire panel that was up there for their words. And then, then I walked down to the front of the stage and I told the guy, I said, I need to look you in your eyes when I say this to you. And I said, because, I, you know, because you've insulted my friends, my colleagues, people walked out of the presentation. And, and I had to let him know, I said, the language you're using is no longer valid language for a group, you know, especially in this group, but in any group. And then, of course, after I sit down and get through with my tongue lashing for this person, because he deserved it, um, then my colleagues uh, started saying things. But they came up to me after the event, and I understood. They said they were in shock. And I said, okay, I, I said, I give you that, that you were in shock, but you, did, you said nothing. And I said, that doesn't mean you're, you're a bad friend. I said, but we, I just need you to find your voice so you can say something. And yes, it had its moment and that was fine but i understand that sometimes people are in shock if i was in shock all the time when people called me names you know called me the n-word you know uh, from where i grew up in south south florida uh then i wouldn't be able to live my life so it, it's like trying to find a way to um embrace the, some of the hate that's going to come after you but also embrace the praise that comes after you as well and so and, and embrace our allies and allies can be people of all different colors and races um, I have to be in uh, different groups, and I know I was recruited to the University at Buffalo with open arms. Um, we have a great president here, and uh, and he makes sure that he always that my husband is included, along with other spouses you know, from same-sex marriages, uh, that we're included in the events. And even at those events where we've gone to, some of them we have to sit down and talk to professors and other distinguished folks. But I do recall at one dinner talking to a professor, and it was fine that I was there with my that I was there as a black person. But as soon as he uh, understood that I was married and that, that was my spouse sitting next to him, that was the last word we heard from him that night. But we did hear from his wife. She was sitting right next to him. So I made sure we kept talking to his wife. You know, and so this is the thing. And mine is get close to people that may disagree with you. Like we heard about this dissenting voices that may be out there. Let those voices dissent. Get close to them. Let them understand who you are. And you're right, you want to be safe. But I, I knew he wasn't going to speak to us the rest of the night. But I made sure I shook his hand before he left that evening and said, well, I hope you have a wonderful evening. Because I needed him to see, not, I could say, oh, it wasn't uh, a race. I don't think it was a race thing. Because he sat there, he saw me when he sat down, started talking to him. But as soon as he found out that, that was my husband uh, that was sitting next to him, uh, I could see him. My husband was oblivious, you know, you know which, which is fun because he, he's a wonderful person that way. Uh, but he's just, he, I didn't notice anything. I said, well, the man never said another word to us. He goes, you're right. I said, but his wife was very talkative. Yeah, so, um, so I just want you to know, find your voice, you know, um, let your allies find their voice, help them find their voice. Uh, and that's what my friends ask me. They say, how can I be a better ally? What can I read? What can I donate to? Where, where can I be? You know, and as we heard, you know, yes, you can't go out and protest because not everybody um, is in a health condition where they can. Um, but we can find our voice and speak up when we think it's wrong. You know, and we're told that. You know, if you see something wrong, speak up. And it's just how we speak up. And, and, and so, but I really want to encourage you, you know, to, you know, find out who you live for, you know, and, and make sure those people are proud of you. 
and then and then find out who you are you know once you know you're living for those people speak to help them not just for them but to help them and help people understand who we are as a full group of people and everything that comes along with us as a human being yeah thanks lee thanks everybody for, for weighing in on that conversation i know i particularly um focus on calling out the, the white folks on the panel to talk about allyship in terms of from a, from a racial perspective i also in, in following up Lee's comment around, um, you know, everybody is an ally to some population and thinking in particular, the, the, the people that are at the margins of the margins within this conversation in particular are black and brown um, trans people, trans gender nonconforming people, trans men, trans women, and thinking about um, when we are talking about racial justice and, and, and allyship from a racial perspective, that also applies to folks that are that experience transphobia. I and mean, it's, it's 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 interconnected. And being mindful that we're um, paying attention to the people at the margins of the margin, because we know that the rates of homicide and violence against uh, particularly black trans women is soaring. It's we don't even have an accurate number because it's it's mis mis counted, they're not counted at all, um, or, they're, or they're misgendered in the, in the reporting. And our, and our structure, to, to Marion's point earlier, our, we don't have the structures to count trans people correctly and to recognize them in, our, in the structures that we have. And so, um, you know, considering and thinking about even our allyship from an intersectional place and, and, and always remembering those folks at the margins of the margin. Um, I'm gonna shift to some questions and we have some themes and, and questions. Um, and so um, this one, and this is re really around um, s around leadership and sharing leadership. And I'll, I'll read a um, a question here. There's a lot of good ones, so I'm trying to pick one. Um, what do you see the role of education, especially especially going into the fall when so much is un is unknown um, in social change? Many students will have pain from challenging institutions, and certainly from the from the pandemic and others uh, will be unsure how to challenge their own privilege. What's our responsibility with the convergence of all of this social unrest and these issues with a pandemic and returning to fall? You could also say, we don't know. <laughs> Any thoughts or pass? We can hard pass on this one. Can you repeat it one more time for us, LB? This question. What, what what are we going to do about all of these convergence of, of these challenging situations in the fall when when students are coming back in pain they're scared they're not sure whether or not they should be back if they're there in person um, what do you, what are y'all thinking um, around the fall? It's definitely a lot um, in that because um, there are questions as to even whether or not we should be converging in the fall on campus um, given the pandemic given that um, communities of color, specifically black and Hispanic communities have more environmentally caused illnesses that put them in greater risk to the COVID-19 um, disease. Um, there are a lot of questions as to how we should be seeing college change in the fall. I think that it's super important given everything that's occurring, including um, pandemic, social change, protests, as well as the upcoming presidential election, we need to really scale up on mental health resources for our students. And we need to see um, increasing our accessibility of mental health services. You know, specifically Stony Brook, we've had some students that are concerned over accessibility to students who don't speak English um, and to students who have different cultural values and different cultural experiences with therapy and how to um, use our services on campus. So I think there's a lot that needs to be looked into making sure that our services are increased and accessible. I don't have an answer, but if you had asked me this question last summer, I would have already been worried about the complexities of being on campus and what was going to be a very polarized election. Now we've got the added challenges of the pandemic. Now you've got the allied, the initial extra, extra challenges. One of the concerns I have is everything Jordan said, if campuses are face to face or not, part of the college experience of being on that island is forming those relationships. And if we have students on campus, but they're not allowed to form relationships, I'm worried that the social benefits and finding allies, supporters, like-minded people being engaged in some of that discussion won't happen and that that will be detrimental. And we won't be able to say there are mental health resources here. If you have language challenges, they're here. 
if you have whatever, there are many resources, but it's harder to get that out. People are overwhelmed being on Zoom all the time. And so I worry that all that we have, we won't be able to provide the services. And so I am, I would say hard pass because I'm even more worried than I was a year ago than I was six months ago than I am now. I don't even know where to start because <laughs> I've been working on this since March and uh, everything you say didn't add to that because I've been, been talking every day, day and night, weekends on this, that it also is going to depend on people wanting to protect others. The social distancing piece is remarkable. You could put anything in place, you know, the shields, the, the barrier, you name it. We all have to do that. And um, several of the campuses have heard from SUNY that we can announce our plans. And I sit there and I think, good God, everything you just said, Gwen, everything you said, Jordan. And I have students saying, I have to come back. It's safer for me there. I have students saying, I can't come back because I'm scared out of my mind. Uh, you know, what happens? What I said to the faculty in, in March, I said, look, use compassion right now because a robust education is compassionate right now. Don't throw a lot of homework at them. That, you know, a lot of people were doing that, the tendency for that. Back off, engage, try to enjoy them because it's too crazy to try to get everything done you need to. Okay, so now here we are again. And I just met with my faculty this morning. And I said, we have to figure out a way where we all have to take care of each other. I said, we may have to do an oath because my students are saying, well, if somebody's not wearing a mask, are you going to kick them off because we want them gone? Where before they would be like, you know, three strikes you're out kind of thing. Now it's one strike. I don't want them here. My students are saying this to me. How do we stop it? So I find it quite interesting in all this going on, the most important piece is that we take care of each other by wearing, I have mine, masks and doing what's right. So are we ready for that? And then the other thing I said to the faculty, in March, you dealt with a bunch of students who knew you, who, who were on campus for the fall and for you know, the beginning of the spring semester. We have a quarter of our students coming who don't know us. Think about that. How do you socialize the first year students now into your experience who are coming from maybe not a very good experience in high school. They don't want to stay home. How do you then show them the way? And so right now we're bringing all of our students back, but only 25% of our classes will be taught in person. So those are the things that I'm grappling with. Is it safer to keep them away? My gut is saying, I don't know why my gut's saying this, but it's saying bring them back bring them back if you can, do what you can, be kind, be compassionate. So my, my approach on this, as someone that deals with enrollment and um, thinks about you know, how students you know, embrace your campus, and especially those first year students, as Marianne said, as they come in that first year trying to understand their new freedom in, in this world of education is, if you understand me as a person, um, when there are issues, I'm the kind of person, if there's a fire, I'm going to run towards it. I'm not going to run away from the fire. I don't try to run around it. Y yeah, yes, I'm assessing what I'm running towards the fire, but I think that's what we're going to be doing uh, it, it come this fall when our students return uh, and the new students join us. Layering it on top of this pandemic, uh, the complexities of students that are burning to uh, use the fire again, you know, it's burning to uh, protest. Uh, to, to share their voice. And my advice has been you know, to our leadership uh, is that we, we need to allow this uh, to happen on the campus as we have in the past with the appropriate advice with our students again, of course, yes, with the social distancing, et cetera. Um, we need to be prepared for the voices of dissent as well on the campus. We need to be prepared with how we're going to communicate with our, our black and brown students, our Asian, Asian American students, our Indian students, all the different groups that make up our community to let them know that this is still a safe environment where you can have heated debates and without fear of you being harmed. 
And so as we think about you know, these parts here and how we're going to organize this, it is, it is, we're starting the school year. There will be classes, you know, there, there will be demonstrations, you know, it's going to be very different demonstrations because of our concern about their safety and their health, mostly their health. And then yes, their safety too, but we definitely want them to be healthy, our students. So it's just, I think we, we have to be prepared to embrace all the pieces that come there. We won't know all the answers. Uh, as Marion is saying, I, I still believe too that we are a good community to bring people back to, especially for those that may not have homes, you know, that they, where they need, uh, you know, their resident halls. And a lot of us cater to that as well. So we welcome that opportunity, but we're gonna have to put a message out there for our students to let them know, yes, you are, I think as a public institution, we are the SUNY system, uh, you are allowed to protest, you are allowed to share your voice, you are allowed to do this, but we also need to make sure that you uh, practice you know, healthy and, and safe type um, activities. And so that's where it's gonna be the challenge, but I think we, uh, this is gonna be a new piece for us. It's, to me, it's a little exciting and scary, yeah, as Marion said, but we are excited about you know, the, the, all the pieces that are gonna come to us this fall and how we manage each activity. Thanks, Joanne. <laughs> that was a big, hard question. Um, good luck with all of your, your efforts. I, um, I am conflicted whether or not I miss being part of it for this time, or if I'm relieved to not have to be at the decision-making table. I'm kind of 50-50, but I wish you all <laughs> really good luck. Um, I'll, I'll close with, uh, there were a lot of questions. So before I close this out, I'm going to ask one more question to the panel. There were a lot of great questions that, you know, we have such a, a great panelist with so many, so many ideas and, and, and insight. We will um, share the questions with the panelists and include their answers with the recording of this, uh, of this, uh, this recording um, so that the questions that we didn't get to verbally uh, will be written out and by some of our panelists. And, and so I think this question is at the crux of the point of this, uh, of, of this topic. And again, a very big question and one that we're not gonna have a, an easy answer to, but I think it's worth uh, talking about and naming um, because it's, it's so important. And so the, the, the person asked, where are the SUNY black trans women? How will SUNY rec recruit, retrain, retain, uplift and support black trans women's lives? Yeah, I'll start with this. I mean, you know, in, in, in college enrollment, we don't know who you are until you tell us who you are. And so, and we, I've learned a long time ago, don't assume uh, who a person is, all, mostly through mistakes, where I assumed something, somebody was something, and it was quite embarrassing when I realized that they were not uh, the person I thought they were. Because, uh, but so, and so it's difficult as you're trying to collect data. Uh, and someone mentioned this, I think, I don't know, LB, I think you mentioned this earlier that um, we just don't have enough data right now to understand that, but we know people are there and we see them uh, in our communities and, but, you know, we don't know what organizations are available to them because students normally have to for form their organizations, just like faculty have to form theirs and staff have to inform their organizations as well. So, but it is one where when a community says all are welcome and that we have to provide an opportunity for people to hear about you know our, our trans population, but we it's not clear where that leadership happens on the on the campus, and so uh, it, this is that's a tough one to to really end on because it, we, you just don't um, at like any time that we're looking for representation, and for many of us, if you're not at the table because you haven't identified and you didn't identify because you understand the social norms that come along in your environment that makes it very difficult, or when you do identify, you may not be invited to the table, you may not be included in the conversations. So it's just how do we build that community? And so, so mine is that, you know, as we're collecting data on our students, as we do now, we collect a lot of data and we try to prepare the campus for the students that are on their way to us. So as we know these students are coming our way, we have to get the campus should always be prepared to um, and, you know, involve them in the campus community. So that's what I have there on, on that one. But I wish I, was, I could have more and say, oh, well, once we know this person and these people and this group, we can start to make the movement a little bit stronger for all. But we can't, as uh, Philip said earlier, you know, and, and Jordan, we don't want to leave people out. And how do we get them to the center and not forget about them and make sure that the urgency for all 
stays important for years out, not just this next couple of months. I would say, what is your um, or what is your institution's outreach plan? What is your assessment plan? Do you assess your communities and not just the current students? So when you're doing outreach and recruitment, they're going high school fairs or doing other uh, modes. I, I know some people who are in higher ed that actually their job, their sole job is to go around the country and set up tables and recruit for their institutions and organizations. Are you including images and, and messaging that shows the places that you are um, inclusive? Are you partnering with, on, a, on your local level, with community-based organizations that are LGBT-centered or focused or have LGBT programming and partnering with them so that community members who go to those events will see you there as a an aspiring ally, at least, because they won't know until they get involved in, in the institution, but at least see you there. So if you're, are, you, are you putting out advertisements in LGBT publications, if you can? Are you putting your, you know, your pamphlets or materials in, into the community and diverse community? So there are some things that you can do as far as community connections. So you're associating yourself with LGBT and other cultural groups, not just LGBT, that's outside of the campus so that they can connect the, the um, organization or institution with being inclusive um, to your community, to the communities. And then once you have individuals in there, like you said, um, Lee, having those assessments and those those data collection tools and um, and being able to have tough conversations because I, when I went to UAlbany, UAlbany thought they were doing what they were, they were supposed to do around LGBT and inclusion, and they were to a certain extent. And the progress that some saw, many people, most of the people of color did not see it. Um, they were like, I don't see this. I see, I, all I see is white folks at, at, at X, Y, and Z place. And if it's LGBT inclusive, it's mostly all white LGBT. What are we doing to, to and it wasn't towards to the time I was leaving the, or the institution that I started seeing more of the progress and um, there were more inclusive um, opportunities for, for um, all LGBT folks. So it is that internal assessment and temperature check. And then there's the external outreach plan to make sure you're intentional and being inclusive. I agree. And actually, Lee, when you're saying it's the leadership, absolutely. You have to, um, in, in many cases, you have to go visit. You've got to get the vibe of the campus uh, because that's sometimes the only way. For example, when I first came, I'm a policy person. I read policies because policies are the result of language and symbols and what people think. And when I first came and was working with the students, uh, first of all, all of my students of color who were in Greeks were in, in underground Greek associations. And I'm like, what is that about? And it was just like they were treated very poorly. And I, again, I said, what this is about? What is this about? So I started a safety zone where I could talk to my students and I wasn't the president. I was a leader, but I wasn't making a formal statement because I had people at the institution who didn't want the students to have a Greek life. They do now, by the way. It took me four years because we did it. But those are the things you have to look at, right? And then um, I noticed that when I was reading the Code of Conduct, there was no Student Bill of Rights. And I said, wait a minute. This is all about how bad you guys are or the, your Code of Conduct. We're always condemning you. Where is, are we lifting you up? So when somebody said, do we are lifting them up? There are ways for you to look at policies and practices that go far beyond just saying, you know, do we have them and pushing. So I also don't tell my students this. Okay. I also teach them how to advocate against me. I teach them how to come into the office and be respectful advocates. Those are the things you have to look for. All right. You've got to go deeper because it's not on the surface. I guarantee it's not on the surface. Thank you for, for that question. It's, it's complicated and we, and we certainly all need to be doing more on all fronts. So we have about five minutes left. I want to end us in a place of, um, unless Philip, were you gonna jump in at anything? I was, but I'm gonna Sorry. let you, I, I, yeah. You go, ahead, no, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go no, ahead. I'm gonna let you go, because I, I saw someone's question about calling out and I wanted to address it, but I don't, um, I'll let I you, you go, go ahead, you address it and then I'll, I'll shorten my closing and go ahead, you address it, it's important. Well, I think it's important because we are in the time, as I mentioned before, education. And um, the person asked, I don't really see the question anymore. I wanted to be very specific, but it was asking, is it just okay to call somebody out? 
And I think in this time of accountability and what does it mean to be an ally and what does it mean to be a supporter of the, of the movements and communities is the importance of knowing the difference in the times in which you're calling people out versus when you're calling people in. And people don't recognize that there's a difference and there is a time and a place to call people out, you know, on blatant, racist, misogynistic, homophobic, transphobic rhetoric or behaviors or actions. And there's also a time to call people in. Calling people out all the time and canceling people all the time be, or firing people all the time because of something they've done in their past or recently is not always productive. It's actually counterproductive in a lot of instances. So the calling people in is turning it into a teachable moment and letting them know the consequences of their actions. And sometimes it's, it's, it's unknown. It, you don't even know that you are perpetuating you know, these types of ideologies or behaviors. And so it is turning it to a teachable moment, having given them opportunity to, it doesn't mean they don't face consequences. They could still be suspended. They could still face, you know, some consequences, but it's not the end all be all of their whole existence and it follows them forever. <laughs> you know, so how do you call people in and have really meaningful dialogue and conversation and educate? And then when do you call people out and say, yeah, that was inappropriate, inappropriate, wrong. You need to be dealt with accordingly, et cetera, et cetera. So I just wanted to let that person know that there are appropriate times to call people out. Um, and what facilitates a lot of the change is calling people in as well and knowing the difference on when to do what. Yes, thank you for jumping in there. That's such an important point. And, and the only thing I will add is whatever, when you're on the receiving end of being calling out or calling in, resisting the the deep urge to shut down <laughs> and using it using it as an opportunity to learn and be better so yeah philip thanks for throwing that in there it's super important okay um we are heading into a potentially long weekend and we have about four minutes left I want, or not just three minutes left if every panelist could just share uh, quickly a, a hope something that a hope that they have or something that they're hoping comes out of this um if there's anything that um we're hopeful for because I think we have to also be hopeful and 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 hold hope and find joy when there's a lot of darkness. So, um, any hopes? Sure, I'll start and I'll make it quick. You know, um, I, I don't know if you had an opportunity to see uh, a commun communication that came out from the president of the University of Florida when they were going through some intense times. And, and, and my hope, like he said, is what we need is a lot more love, you know, in this world and love for humankind. And so, and that's what I really hope for with people, you know, and I, and I, I feel about love that what you said there by calling people in. I never looked at it that way, but, I, but that is what, when you have questions for them and you're trying to understand where they're coming from and get them to continue the conversation. So, and as, and as I remember, um, Barack Obama saying is that we need to continue the conversation. Um, don't just shut down, as LB said, you know, as well, and finding ways to have that. So I hope that you find love and that you continue the conversation so people could get to know you um, and, and that you find a way forward so everyone feels that they're being treated, you know, as a human and a citizen, you know, of this world. I would hope that as we're having those conversations that we is hoping continue to happen that we listen and we can really hear what people are actually saying because the pursuit of happiness is my happiness and your happiness and all of our happinesses and we need to hear what people really are saying my hope is that education becomes enlightenment again in all of its glory Some of what I hope I'm seeing come true in the uplifting and activism of our students. Um, I'm seeing some great social media platforms being used and accounts being used to uplift our voices. Um, specifically at Sunnybrook, and I'd love to see the activism continue into the fall with our students and that you know that SUNY should be, whatever campus, should be a place for everyone. And if you don't feel that you are getting the experience and education that you deserve, that you feel empowered and able to stand up and continue this fight even into the fall. Um, this is not this fight's not just our, our summer our summer outing. This is this is a continued thing that's going to keep going. 
I appreciate that. I agree with that. I echo that. Um, my my hope is that we recognize there's unity and diversity, and it's important to recognize that we all are different and unique. And it's important to recognize that doesn't mean that our differences have to divide us. They can actually be unifying factors if we're all on board and, and willing to learn, be uncomfortable, have difficult conversations, and grow together. So that's my hope. Thanks, everybody. My hope is that uh, everybody on this call learned half as much as I did and enjoyed it as half as much as I did. I, deep appreciation to the panelists, um, deep appreciation to everyone that sat uh, with us throughout the, the full 90 minutes and a deep appreciation to all the people behind the scenes that made this happen, our tech folks and all the SUNY Pride folks that made all these events happen. Thank you very much and have a good rest of your day. Take care.